The Joint Assembly will please come to order. Sergeant. The members of the Joint Assembly will please rise to receive her honor, the Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court and her distinguished escort committee. Please be seated. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen of the Joint Assembly and honored guest, I am proud to present to you the Honorable Gene Hafer Toll, Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Thank you very much. Mr. S Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Joint Assembly, uh, what a grand honor it is for the twelfth time to address you as your Chief Justice and report on the state of the South Carolina judiciary. I intend to do two things with this address, uh, the first of which is to give you a ground level look at where our system stands and what might be done by means of improving on the considerable progress that we have made over the last 12 years. And the second is to travel up to about 30,000 feet and look at court systems in the states and relate that to where we are in global market economy and how the courts fit into the progress we want to make there. So let me begin with a tribute to a legend, a giant in South Carolina, uh, has gone. Uh, Matthew Perry began his life uh, in an atmosphere where opportunities were very limited for much of our population. And with a brilliant mind, a backbone of steel, a melodious voice, and a gentle and decent approach to one and all, he achieved great personal greatness but he brought South Carolina just as firmly into the 21st century as if he had led every hand. We will miss him. South Carolina courts. <laughs> South Carolina courts have as a core mission to provide a fair, efficient forum for the resolution of disputes. That's the business we're in. But economic development is very impacted by the ability of the judicial branch to fairly and timely resolve disputes. It's a highly important factor 
in economic development as I am learning more and more as I interact with South Carolina and American business leaders on the importance of the courts here and abroad. Uh, here in South Carolina, South Carolina business courts have been an important dimension of indicating to the business community that business to business disputes that involve the protection or disputes about intellectual property, copyrights, trademarks, contracts, and the other things that are the baseline of the ability to develop in an atmosphere of stability uh, products and market them uh, was a significant consideration to the influx of such business as Amazon, BMW, Boeing, Bridgestone Firestone, Continental Tires, Michelin, and the many others who are now looking with new eyes at investment in South Carolina. Your court system, I have come to understand through many contacts, uh, pre-location is a very important investment for you to make in the stability uh, of South Carolina. Our approach in the South Carolina Judicial Department focuses on technology, business models and processes and management techniques to achieve the results of efficiencies, consistencies, and better organization. But our system is in trouble. Our circuit case caseload, which is kind of the benchmark of where we sit in our ability to hear cases in South Carolina, is now at the bottom in national ranking. What that means is the national average of judges per 100,000 is 3.1. We are at 1.0. The national average of filings per general level trial judge in the United States state court systems is 700, 1,791. And this year, we passed the 5,000 mark per judge at 5,011. When I first became your chief, we were in the 3,000s. So despite the many efficiencies that we have put in place to try to move cases and eliminate backlogs in both circuit and family court, the filings are continuing to increase. And we must now look at new investment in judicial personnel for South Carolina. A quick look at our funding sources when I became chief in 2000. That year it took about $46 million <laughs> plus to run the judicial department and almost all of it, as that blue pie indicates, was general revenue money. Today, it takes about $63 million to run the judicial department. And of that, about 60% is general appropriation money. The rest is state fees and a short wedge of federal funds, which we'll be dissipating shortly. And as I explained last year and you responded, I have a plan as to how to sustainably replace that fund without tapping into general revenue funds. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the budget requests this year on the recurring fund side are to replace what all of us call the Bernie Maybank uh, aggressive enforcement of taxation one-time money with permanent recurring funding of our travel. That's the ability to take the few judges we have and put them where they're needed around the state. Uh, our annual technology equipment replacement and licensing, we haven't asked to recur this before, but as we uh, run short of federal money for the next two years, we're going to be asking for recurring funds here to be sure that the system we've built is sustainable. And finally, General Services does not have the money to repair the Calhoun building adequately, and I have provided some of that money from savings from the Judicial Department because we occupy that building entirely now, including our data center that serves uh, all of the counties of South Carolina with our case management. Uh, uh, but the centerpiece of what I'm suggesting to you this year is new judges. Uh, three new circuit court judges and six family courts is what I proposed. I realize you may not be able to do that. I understand that there's very constructive conversation taking place in ways and means uh, about how much of this could be done. Family court is the huge priority. People are hurting and desperate in our family court system because of the huge volume of cases and their inability to get their disputes heard. One out of every five days of family court is taken up simply collecting child support, most of which does not go to custodial parents, but goes to the Department of Social Services as a uh, refund for the TANF money uh, that is provided uh, to indigent custodial parents. So 
I'm doing a lot with our family court system to collect for the Department of Social Services and real people who need help suffer because we don't have the family court time for them. On the non-recurring side would be some startup costs for our new judges and staff and the completion of our technology by centralizing our court statistics. That's really the key to being able to manage where the cases are and how to keep them moving. Uh, case management hosting of municipalities, that's the only part of the grassroots court system that's not completely automated in the system, and an upgrade in architecture for other trial court applications as we become more sophisticated about how we manage these cases. The new dimension, though, is electronic filing. You may recall that last year, this General Assembly invested five million dollars to begin to develop electronic filing and that would mean that in every court in the state uh, papers, pleadings and other things could be filed electronically and accessed by everybody on our internet based system. This would be an enormous savings to people who use the courts. Uh, we would had to develop a stable database uh, in the attorney community uh, I took that program from the South Carolina Bar and used Judicial Department resources and uh, uh, our technology uh, folks to develop this system. It's in place now and that's the platform. We will begin shortly to build the electronic uh, uh, system. You can still file on paper, but I will guarantee you that most people will find that electronic filing allows them to file 24-7 with the court system and in a form that's a lot less expensive in the final analysis than having to use the old paper and delivery method. But when completed, this e-filing system will also be a funding source for our technology and it will replace that column of federal money I've talked to you about uh, with money generated not from general revenue funds but from electronic filing and here's the reason why. Ordinarily, uh, states simply pick a vendor and build an electronic filing system, but of course the vendor is paid the fees that it takes to file and that is how they make their money. I have a technology uh, group on staff now in-house that will build this system. We'll own it and the fees that are generated will go right back into the technology system and that's how I proposed last year when I talked to Ways and Means uh, and to Finance uh, to fund uh, the absence of technology federal funds. So we believe we've got a sustainable uh, project here and technology is certainly the key to your not spending any more than you have to in terms of new judicial personnel. Well, the technology roadmap has kind of been the hallmark. I've talked to you about a, this issue a lot as I've come every year, but I'm proud to announce that as of June of this year, every county in South Carolina is now live on the case management system that isn't owned by some software company out there or communicated with by its users through Peggy from Alaska. <laughs> this one's owned by us. This is a South Carolina created and owned case management system uh, that we run, that we staff, that we support 24-7 uh, with call centers and the like. And of the 46 counties, 32 are hosted here in Columbia. They don't even host it on their servers. Counties were suspicious about that at first, but they now see the South Carolina court system as the gold standard for a system that's transparent, that is maintained and from which they can get the kind of service they never got from the vendors when they all had to get their systems on their own. Uh, the, the counties with that gold H in back of them are all hosted now and my guess is before it's all over, uh, most of the remaining counties, most of whom have inquired, will probably be hosted by the Judicial Department. A true statewide system that I'd put up against any other automation project you've ever talked about for any other aspect of state government. We are very proud of how this project has proceeded. The, the, the uh, crown of this project is to automate our appellate system and we're doing that now. Uh, we, it is uh, way into development. We will begin to roll it out in April and the entire appellate system will be automated by November with public access to briefs, to records, and to everything that goes on in the appellate system. I think that's going to be an enormous benefit, not just for judges and lawyers and public officials, but for the many average South Carolinians that want to see what goes on with these cases and understand how it affects their dispute 
uh, in court. LT Court Tech has been a great partner. This is a company that is probably the most recognized company in the country for appellate case management, and I played off of very successful programs in Oregon, uh, uh, Washington, and other states to design the one we have. Uh, Docket management is another key thing that we have to look at. We have to see how we can be more effective about managing the dockets. Kay Hearn has headed up this past year uh, a project to look at court operations in our three big statewide trial dockets, family court, circuit court, common pleas, that's civil, and circuit court general sessions, that's criminal. Uh, we are going to have a lot of recommendations in task forces headed by Costa Placonis for General Sessions, Danny Pieper for Common Pleas, and Aphrodite Conduras for Family Court. Uh, among those, of course, is additional judges and staff. But we also want to develop some additional programs to fast-track jury trials and to try to redesign how General Sessions uh, operates. For 12 years, I have begged the solicitors of this state to bring a more standardized and effective management of General Sessions cases. We are still very behind on all of these dockets, and we are the only state in the union where the solicitors manage the docket. I don't wish to pick a fight with anybody, but the day has come and gone when we can have a horse and buggy way. Uh, violent crimes go unprosecuted, County jails fill up with people who have not been tried, and justice is simply not served by the enormous backlogs on the General Sessions side. So we will be giving, as a court, and I as your chief, some strong consideration to a different approach to how to manage General Sessions cases. And you may yourselves be involved in what the final rules of the road will be, but we cannot tolerate any more the backlogs in this part of the system. We certainly want to use backup case docketing so that if a case breaks down, you've got one that follows right behind. That takes some standardized management, not just I do it this way in this county and I do it another way in another county. And we are very committed to making this happen with a lot of good advice from clerks of court all over South Carolina, lawyers, uh, judges. It's been a, law enforcement, uh, the social service agencies. We've had a broad group of people involved in seeing how we can redesign the way we do business in these big dockets. Mandatory mediation is, I think, something that we need to look very seriously at now, and it needs to begin in family court. Families are broken by the adverse nature of decisions about custody and visitation. It's always a battle between two different sides, and perhaps mediation would bring some peace to these kinds of desperate family difficulties without having the adversarial process uh, be there to try to resolve things. We're going to be trying that shortly. Uh, and we need to a lot greater time for complex cases. That's a part of this jammed up docket, that cases that are really complicated don't have their due in the system. One docket that I've used to try to experiment with how can you give more complicated cases a different approach is business courts. Uh, the business court pilot has now been extended again. I'm using it in Char Charleston, Greenville, and Richland with three great circuit court judges who've taken special training to tr try these business-to-business -business disputes. It gets them out of the regular docket, leaving more time on that docket for cases, but it also gives beginning-to-end management. Uh, we hope our business court will more and more begin to look like uh, the ones that are so acclaimed, like the Delaware Chancery Court and the North Carolina Business Court, and those are the models that we are, we are focusing on. Uh, we've concentrated on self-help for pro se litigants. This terrible economic time has uh, deprived a lot of good, hard-working South Carolinians who hold, hold regular jobs but cannot afford to pay for legal representation, has forced them into going to court and trying to represent themselves, and that is a tough, tough proposition for many of them. And legal aid money is simply not there as it once was for a lot of folks who need some help in getting into court to resolve their disputes, particularly in family court. So we're experimenting in Newberry. We set up this self-help center in July. We've already served over 50 clients. Uh, the vast majority have income levels of $21,000 or less. You can imagine how little there is in a budget like that for private representation for these kinds of issues. 
Uh, we're not taking the bread out of anybody's mouth, uh, uh, I can assure you, but we are providing lawyers who are volunteers and college students who are helping these folks with model pleadings and forms navigate uh, in self-represented fashion uh, the complexities of the court system. Civics, civics education continues to be a very important part of what I think we have a duty to do as the court system of South Carolina. Uh, I frankly think uh, that the absence of mandatory civics education in South Carolina's uh, uh, school age uh, curriculum is a terrible, terrible blow to the ability of citizens to understand what their government is uh, and participate in it. Uh, but I'm proud to tell you that South Carolina was ranked as A rating when it comes to teaching students American history, and our court's involvement has helped strengthen that considerably. Most states are rated mediocre to awful, and South Carolina's rating is something we can all be very proud of. Our Court-initiated uh, programs included a class action program where students study our cases and come to the Supreme Court, a case of the month, another method of having stu students study court cases and then interact with the court, uh, graphic novels, uh, 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 which for a kind of a target of seventh and eighth graders, uh, uses the graphic novel, novel format that's so popular with kids now, just as it was with me when I was a little girl. I loved Superman and all those comic books. Now they call them by the sophisticated name of graphic novels. But we have developed some that have the stories of real life cases and how they proceed through the court system. It's a great teaching tool. In fact, I said, why are we limited to, to kids? We put them in our self-help centers and hopefully we'll distribute them around in public areas where uh, people gather for other purposes to leave some material that would interest them and teach them about the court system. And iCivics, uh, the wonderful partnership with Justice Sandra Day O'Connor that uses an interactive video game media developed by George Lucas and Steven Spielberg to teach, uh, targeted primarily at middle schoolers and high schoolers, to teach them through a game format how court works. We now have nine games that use court themes that use legislative themes and executive uh, themes and these kids get points for interacting and they're all based on what they know and learn about how government operates. It's a wonderful teaching tool and our Supreme Court Institute in the summer takes teachers and teaches them how to use this new media and frankly it's for more than just civics and the Sandra Day O'Connor project. Teachers now need to be able to know how to do something more than write it on the blackboard. Kids don't learn just that way. They're in their computers all the time. So this is also an outreach to the teaching community to participate in teaching new media uh, to those who are teaching our children. Well, the absolute tremendous honor for Sandra Day O'Connor to have personally presented me on the behalf of the state this summer with the Sandra Day O'Connor Civics Education Award. Uh, but I want to introduce you now to a real South Carolina hero. Rosalind Frierson began her career here in these halls as a budget analyst at the South Carolina, Ways, uh, South Carolina House of Representatives Ways and Means after a distinguished business and accounting degree experience at the University of South Carolina, I'm proud to say, on USC Day. Now, then Rosalind became our director of court administration. This year, she is president of the National Conference of State Court Administrators and vice chair of the board of directors of the National Center for State Courts. She's just finished a two-year executive leadership program at Harvard University, and her uh, thesis will be published shortly. Uh, she sets the gold standard nationally and is recognized, and I just can't say how proud I am of this great uh, court director. Rosalind, would you stand for a moment and be recognized? Now, if I might, let me take you up to that mythical 30,000 feet for a minute. I would argue that the United States commitment to the rule of law, when compared with nations taking steps toward democracy, whether it's in the Middle East, the former Soviet Union, the nations of this hemisphere, I would 
project that our commitment to the rule of law most heavily influences the role of the court systems around the world. Our commitment to the rule of law, particularly the liberties enshrined in our Constitution, is exceptional even when compared with our democratic friends and allies like Great Britain, which has much tighter restrictions on the release of government information, or other nations of Western Europe that are still struggling with their economy more than any other country on the planet. The United States upholds basic liberties because they're etched in our founding documents and stitched into the fabric of our national tapestry. And because of our faith in the marketplace of ideas and the common sense of our fellow citizens. But whatever the reason, our commitment to the rule of law and basic liberties doesn't just improve the quality of our lives, I would submit. It enhances our capacity to grow and prosper economically. In my view, those nations still in transition will come to learn that until they have a rule of law where businesses can be sure they can enforce their contracts, that their intellectual property will be protected, that citizens are free to speak their minds, those nations will never reach their full potential. And Russia, for example, is a great case in point. 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia is in the midst of pursuing its stated aspiration of becoming a prosperous democracy that is integrated into the West, but it continues to struggle, as you've recently seen with the protests in Russia that followed their so-called parliamentary elections, and the reluctance of a lot of companies to invest in their economy, and a similar concern of high-tech industries to invest in their economy. Pragmatic business women and men want to invest where they can expect a reasonable return and an absolute assurance that the legal system in the country they are investing in will provide due process. Uh, when business considers investing in a country with a poor record of internet freedom, of protection of uh, uh, the property of the corporations, when counterfeiting runs wild, they are no different than the Somali pirates in terms of their attractiveness uh, to investment. This is one of the many reasons why a recent report from Boston Consulting Group concluded that by some time around 2015, for many goods destined for North American consumers, manufacturing in some parts of the United States will be just as economical as manufacturing in China, where so much has been outsourced to this and other nations. When I attended the conference of chief justices a week and a half ago, top leaders from DuPont, Ford, Intel, Masterlock, and others spoke to us about the importance of state courts. And I think Eleanor Kuhlman, the current CEO of DuPont Corporation, uh, put it best. She said, we're insourcing now. We're coming back because global economy, jobs, progress through the free market depends on consistent and stable court systems. Outsourcing, she said, has now become insourcing because of the protection of property that is needed, whether you're a pharmaceutical company, whether you're DuPont, no matter who you are, folks who have thought that the less expensive way to create manufactured goods and value was to go abroad are now realizing that the stability of the American marketplace and its court system is a major reason to come back home. So an American court system and its fair and consistent enforcement of the rule of law is, I would suggest to you, the bedrock of American economic progress. You can't make a better investment as a General Assembly than to support our fine court system here in South Carolina, nationally recognized, as we continue to be your partner in making South Carolina achieve uh, its real goals. Well, you know I always finish with Patrick. And there he is, living the dream as a ball kid for his father's alma mater, the George Washington Colonials. That young man is what we're all working for, uh, is creating the kind of world in which they can thrive and prosper and make the next inventions uh, for the betterment uh, of progress and humankind that we can only dream of. I'm honored beyond what I can say to be your partner 
as we move South Carolina forward. God bless. Members of the Joint Assembly will please rise. The Chief Justice and Earth's Distinguished Party depart the Joint Assembly. The purpose for which this joint assembly has been called having been completed, I hereby declare it adjourned.